all of the things that are, are we're being hit with. So, right. Whereas corporate media, you know, um, which silences uh, the voices that should be being heard, um, they're making lots of yeah, you know, lots of money. We are live. Okay. And, yeah, and and I'm gonna, yeah, I do. We have a process uh, set up in place specifically. Should we introduce ourselves first? Um, I'm just gonna back up and. So I think yeah. for maybe that haven't watched the film and that don't know what the hell we are doing on this Facebook page, maybe we can yeah. try to <laughs> reframe the debate. And uh, and I know that, uh, yeah, Brenda, maybe as you are the co-host of the event with uh, Films for Action, so maybe you want to introduce the event. What, uh, what just happened? What just happened? Well, I just, uh, I'm sure like many of the people who are here are just blown away. Our hearts are, are um, um, uh, breaking and yet they're strengthened and they're inspired by the power of uh, your media message. Um, uh, that story, uh, the line about the ant fighting the jaguar just seems so um, relevant right here. And um, we're hoping to focus tonight on um, how you how this film is used as a media impact tool and the power of media impact and its critical um, uh, voice, especially in protecting the earth, in um, uh, uh, changing the silence, breaking through the silence of corporate media to um, hear the voices of First Nations people that cannot be silenced um, um, that move us to action, that connect to our heart and our spirits to, so that we can all join a struggle um, to save Mother Earth. And so I'm just going to ask you, um, before you get totally tired, Clement, how you, um, you know, if we could get inside your brain, um, you made this Which film, brain? but <laughs> <laughs> how do you see this um, what are your strategies and insights as a, a media maker um, to have impact? Oh, uh, what are your strategies? Because the people on this call um, especially want to learn from each of you how media, how you're using media as an impact tool. Um, and hopefully that they can be the media too. So what, and before you really get tired, um, what are some of the strategies and lessons that you've learned and that you continue to learn as you move forward? And then once we're done with that, let's introduce everyone and then we'll all start the bigger conversation. <laughs> cool. Okay. So first of all, uh, for the people that haven't watched the film and uh, that were not on the webinar jam platform, uh, we are, uh, so I am the co-director of the film. Brian here, I mean, maybe he's here for you. I don't know where. Uh, <laughs> uh, Brian is one of the film protagonists. And we have just watched the, the internationally acclaimed award-winning documentary <laughs> film, The Condor and the Eagle, uh, which, uh, so um, yeah. And right now uh, we are having this conversation with independent and indigenous media makers around uh, how can we use independent media work as an organizing tool. Uh, we are fortunate to have uh, our friends at the uh, Films for uh, Action that allowed us to um, uh, have this event on their uh, Thank you. play page. Thank you very much for that. And we have great news as well. We are uh, releasing our film internationally uh, on VOD, Video On Demand, the July 1st, which is, I think, next Wednesday. Uh, and this is uh, the film will be available to rent on this platform, on the Films for Action platform. So somehow, you know, this is a this is a good collaboration. This is just the beginning of a, a longer collaboration. I'm very excited to introduce the event this way. Uh, thank you as well uh, for um, uh, to Brenda, Brenda Miller, and works with the Sanctuary for Independent Media. Who is uh, actually she is the one that. Uh, it has the, the, the origin of this event. 
And uh, we were supposed to meet actually uh, last month or two months ago in New York and do a, a storytelling workshop. And, and uh, basically that's what we are trying to do, you know. Uh, this is the first film we have ever done. I've never touched a cinema camera before, I've never done a film before. But uh, what is so important is not uh, really like making a film, it's trying to find the right tools for our, uh, the, the right storytelling tools for the right goals. And uh, to us, that was a st strategic uh, approach. So how can we have the most impact uh, for what we're looking for? And, uh, and we just thought that uh, film was just uh, the best tool at our disposal. So, uh, okay, so that's the, the intro. If you have like a specific question right now, I would appreciate it. And oh yeah, why am I tired? Because I live in Germany and because it's uh, <laughs> 3 a.m. in the morning and because uh, from today until Sunday, we organize uh, five online events because this event is part of an impact campaign called uh, No More Sacrificed Communities. And uh, two weeks during, we organize, uh, or 10 organization partners organize and host a similar events. So that's it. Thank you. Um, should we go around and introduce each person? I think so, yes. Brian, do you want to start? Sure, yeah. And uh, just want to thank everyone um, for joining us tonight. And my name is Brian Farras. I live in Houston, Texas. And uh, I have been working on environmental justice issues for about 20 years, since uh, 1999, uh, when I came back from college. And simultaneously, I've been learning how to use media and, you know, been heavily influenced by the, the independent media um, movement that started about that time too. And so a lot of what, uh, what I've done has been from, you know, just learning, learning on the fly and, and being the media, as you said, um, and uh, been a really empowering experience. Um, and it's uh, really helped me um, grow as, you know, as a person um, and also given me, you know, a sense of, of being connected to the long history of work that's that so many uh, of our communities and our, our families and, you know, elders and those before us have done. So I'm very much a, a fan of, of media. I've been a radio producer too on one of the Pacifica stations, KPFT here in Houston with a group called Nuestra Palabra, Latino writers having their say. And so I uh, like to play around with all sorts of different uh, modalities. Um, and I'm also a theater of the oppressed uh, practitioner. So I like to use body um, and, and interact with people uh, in physical space as well. So. I'll stop there. And, well, for those of the, for yeah. those who don't maybe know about theater of the oppressed, could you just explain a little more what what a theater of the oppressed practitioner is? Yeah, yeah. So it's a, it's a style of um, sort of role playing theater that breaks the is it called the fourth wall, the third wall? Again, like I'm not a a, a trained college for this, um, but it's interactive, and so it's theater that is develop and meant to come up with solutions um, by enacting scenes um, that are a big problem or an issue. So they focus around um, conflict. And it's often, you know, a very, very beautiful process. Thinking of about the, the humanity of the oppressed and also, you know, how the oppressors um, think as well. And, and the goal is to come up with a solution and folks who are watching the skits actually participate um, in the scenes. So you, you play the scene, you stop it, and then a person in the audience comes and uh, you know, improv through improvisation um, tries to come up with a solution and the spect actors um, then have to respond right to this. So it's, uh, it's just another really incredible tool that was developed and, and 
uh, Latin America in Brazil um, by a uh, incredible man, Augusto Boal. And it, it has also been a very, you know, uh, amazing um, part of, of uh, organizing that, that I've been fortunate enough to, yeah, <laughs> to uh, engage in. And actually, this film actually was constructed with participatory action, right? There's no voiceover. It's, it, it just shifts the voice to the people. Clement, do you want to make any comment about that? I mean, you, you, it's participatory in practice, right? Yes, yes. Uh, so there's no voiceover um, and there was no script involved. Basically, we were just a, a couple of uh, lost Europeans uh, in a small van just crossing a continent. And um, when you asked a question, you know, what's um, for you, what's media as an organizing tool? And how can you, you know, like, um, what's your strategy to use media, right? Uh, there is no strategy, you know, strategy is super wrong. Uh, deep listening is the first step towards like uh, powerful storytelling. So before you're able to speak, you first need to learn how to listen very deeply. And, uh, and so that's, you know, participation is very often uh, just uh, listening to others and understand better what they mean. <laughs> so, you know, this is the first step towards like quality independent media that has a very deep impact is because uh, we need to constantly ask ourselves by seeing what I see, what is it that I don't see? <laughs> by pre, pre, you know, like when you, um, your prejudices are basically what lays between you and the other. And so by just like shutting your mouth and listening, maybe filming, uh, then you are able to uh, get closer to this person and empathize. And through uh, documentary, through producing the video, you can then touch the heart of the audience because they empathize back. But first you do it, need to do it yourself, you know? So that's, the, that's it. Thank you. Jade, do you want to introduce yourself? We're so honored to have you here. Oh, thank you so much, Brenda. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll go ahead and introduce myself next. Um, I'm Jade Begay. Uh, um, I am uh, of the Tisuke Awinga Pueblo in Northern New Mexico, so called Northern New Mexico, and I'm also Diné. Um, and uh, I am creative director uh, currently at the NDN Collective, um, an indigenous led organization that uh, works to build indigenous power through capacity building, through philanthropy and grant making, um, and also through narrative change. And that's really like my, um, yeah, my life passion, my obsession, my, um, the thing that gives me energy and makes me wake up at the, uh, or like get energized and go in the morning um, is this idea of narrative change. Um, so I'm, I'm a filmmaker, a storyteller, um, a cultural organizer and um, narrative change activist. I also uh, work very closely with indigenous rights um, groups and uh, climate groups to advance those types of narratives and those types of stories. Uh, yeah, and happy to be here. So excited. Yeah. <laughs> Could you just share a little more about narrative change? Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, people think in a documentary, there isn't necessarily a narrative. There's narratives all around us. And you're, what is your, this, this concept of narrative change? Mm. Yeah, so uh, to me, uh, you know, the reason why I, I was really pulled as like a young person into storytelling work was that I grew up seeing um, uh, you know, very little representation of people like me. And uh, if it, if there was representation, it was stereotypical, it was offensive, it was harmful. Um, there's great research out there led by uh, the organization Illuminative that really points out like the data on how indigenous peoples are represented in um, the US and that data is very stark. Um, I am 
not going to list all of them. Maybe I can get into that in a little later. But uh, the fact is, a lot of Americans don't even know we exist. And when it comes to issues like climate change, like indigenous rights, like fighting fossil fuel infrastructure that often, you know, harms indigenous communities, uh, that's a huge barrier because how, how can people understand our story, understand our plight um, when they don't even know we exist? Um, and like I said, that's a large population um, of Americans who don't know we're even here or alive. Um, and, and the reasons for that are, are vast, uh, namely education fails to represent modern day um, or even mention modern day native people in, in curriculum. So yeah, there are so many things that contribute to this erasure of indigenous peoples here in North America um, and globally, but yeah, uh, specifically talking about North America uh, in my case. Um, so anyways, uh, yeah, I, I work to challenge that. I work to create narratives that build visibility. Um, at the end of the day, that's that's what it's all about. Um, so that people do empathize with us, look, know our history, know that we're here, um, so that you know our rights, our sovereignty is um, ultimately respected. Thank you. That is so incredibly important for indigenous people and for mother earth, uh, so critical to change the narrative. Thank you. Leo, yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Leo, do you wanna introduce yourself? Hello, thank you. Thank you, Brenda, Jade, Brian, Clement. Uh, my name is Leo Cerda. I am from the Quechua Nation in the Ecuadorian Amazon. I, I am from the community of Serena. I work with uh, indigenous communities from the Amazon uh, towards protecting and defending the, our ancestral territories against mining and oil concessions. I also work with uh, women and youth um, in storytelling and, and using media as a tool to raise awareness about what is happening in the Amazon, especially to give uh, us a platform in which it, we can express and control and and be able to talk about our stories, our narrative, and have control over our narrative. Because a lot in a lot of the spaces, uh, local is very important for us to be able to have control over the narrative, the narrative of our people, the, the conflict, everything that is happening here through our own lens, our own eyes, and our own words. So I think uh, and that's why in the couple of uh, uh, a few years, I've been working on, on these issues with, especially with youth and now what um, seeing what is happening. I think this is a very important tool about like storytelling and media. So our communities can, can you know, strengthen their, 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 their stories and our way to, that we wanna share these stories with the public and, and locally and internationally, as well as locally, because uh, when we talk about stories, our, our stories do not necessarily have to go internationally. We have to be able to talk to our brothers and sisters along the Amazon, along the South, with our brothers and sisters in, in the North. That's why I think this film, I, I, uh, when I see like our brothers and sisters coming from the North to visit the Amazon and seeing the reality here of what is happening here, a lot of, a lot of the root causes of climate change happen to uh, communities of color. You know, we are the first one to face the consequences of climate change, the, uh, the consequences of the lack of access to health services, the consequences of a pandemia. So that's why spaces like these are very important and, and especially storytelling so we can tell our stories. Thank you. And when you talk about controlling the narrative, um, and you mentioned especially working with youth and women. Why is that so important? Can you share a little more about the importance of those voices in particular? Yeah, I think uh, controlling the narrative because a lot of, especially like media tries to control and tell their story for their own benefit or to, uh, what um, is their own, um, you know, limit on their spaces. They do not necessarily want to tell the whole truth. 
that will uh, uh, benefit the communities, you know, like, for example, here, like the government will say something, oh, we're doing clean, clean, uh, clean uh, oil, you know, we're going to do clean mining or, and the media will support that. But when we say, oh, there is, uh, there actually destroying the land we are part of the land and for us it's not the same like if we don't have access to water if we don't have access to this this is why this is so important for us to maintain and protect and defend the amazon and uh a lot of the knowledge a lot of the knowledge a lot of the 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 people who can who transmit this knowledge and the stories and the stories of our people are our moms are uh, especially our our moms there are women to that transmit to their children and our elders that's why uh for me especially now it is important to work with women i i uh my friend and i started a project to work with women across the amazon doing handcrafts and now we're do, doing a storytelling a storytelling because we saw that while women were doing the handcrafts they will speak to their children about the stories and why why are they making these designs why is it important the work that we're doing here and now the youth, the youth want to tell their story. Like now that we have internet and we have access to things, and we want to be able to tell our stories, our jokes, our um, our lives, and, and, and through our own lens. You know, for me, going to uh, I was in New York for Climate Week last year, and we we saw a lot of a lot of um, a lot of uh, uh, people uh, giving a platform to like. Uh, Anglo speakers, you know, and, and, and I was like so happy that people will have those spaces, but I, I, I was also thinking that, oh, it'll be nice if we as indigenous people will have the same access to those spaces to tell and talk about our own stories. There's youth people in the Amazon, there's youth people in Mexico, there's youth people in the North and the Arctic and Europe and New Zealand, there's people all over the place and we need the same equalitarian access to be able to tell our own stories. So that's why I think it's very important to work with youth and women especially. Yes, thank you. And so it's time now for all of you people here in the Be The Media workshop to be the media and ask questions in the chat. And while we wait for that, do any of the panelists wanna ask each other questions? Do you have any questions for each other? That's just such an amazing beginning of a conversation. See if Jade has anything. It's like I had a comment. Uh, just kind of wanted to um, add something to Leo's comment. Uh, I think it is really important one for local media to change. And I often feel like that's the worst, you know. And and more people um, watch the local news, for example, at ten o'clock or six o'clock. I don't know what time they show it in. Uh, Ecuador, Leo, but here it's like, you know, every, every day from like four to six and then from 10 till 1030. And one, like you rarely see people of color. You hardly ever see, I, I almost say never here in Houston, indigenous voices in the local news. And if you do, just like uh, Jade said, and just like you said, it's usually you know, destructive, negative, um, or really cheesy, like anecdote, uh, anecdote that plays stereotypes. So it's really important. I think it's the hardest thing to change is local news. Um, and, and I know that uh, I do Nicaragua uh, um, to learn about this woman's co-op in a little town called Mulukuku and they had a radio station. Um, I think it was low power FM, but, uh, but it was incredible, you know, what this co-op was able to do um, and how they utilized radio in very small towns um, around the area and, and really like helped empower uh, women uh, in many different ways. And I think, you know, what I've learned from the work that I do on environmental issues is that when we help those who are least empowered, everyone benefits. Like it, it just, it elevates everyone's standard of living um, and it, it makes sure that, uh, you know, everyone's rights are, are respected. 
So the most oppressed, you know, as I said in the film too, you know, I think for me is a way to sort of think about organizing. Like we have to help those from the bottom up. Thank you. We have two I, questions. Um, I just, yeah. Oh, Leo, come on. I just have one last comment and uh, it was, um, yeah, it is important to, I think the use of media well, from what we're seeing recently, like we were seeing like the uprising that is happening in the US. We saw the uprising that happened in Ecuador against the policies that, that IMF was trying to impose through the Ecuadorian government. And then we saw the protests in Chile, the protests in Brazil. And for, for us, I was talking to uh, all, uh, other friends and other indigenous friends around the South and about like how we are using media tools to tell our stories. For example, when we are in the front lines of the protests, the police caught uh, the, the internet, like the like our phones, you know, our phones are are like our are, are tools that we can bring and, and tell us our like independent media and independent uh, news and depending uh, films that it will help us because uh, when we're in the front lines, whenever we need to tell, tell the stories, we tell it through our own channels because the mass media won't reproduce what we are uh, going through. So that's why I think like that, especially in those moments, like when we're seeing the uprising in the US, like people sending the message, security stuff like that to support each other mutually and mutual solidarity. I think this is one of the best impacts and, and the best ways that we can use uh, media tools to empower our communities. Thank you. Um, Clement or Brian, do you want to respond to the question, what have been some reactions from indigenous communities to the film and also reactions from other communities as well? Yeah, I mean, I can, I can add a little, you know, our plan was actually to take the film into communities this spring and we all know what happened, right? So a lot of those uh, um, reactions um, we're still waiting, you know, to happen. We did have a, a really um, good response from screenings in Canada um, that took place in different indigenous communities. And, uh, you know, I was not present for them um, because we have a partner in Canada who's been leading that up, um, Indigenous Climate Action. And the whole point is to support whatever local indigenous uh, media makers and, and organizations um, are present there, right? But I will say that the issues that are present in the film, you know, are, have been, has been very uh, important for people to see, you know, whether it's the uh, missing murdered indigenous women, um, fight that's been happening, you know, a lot longer than this film, you know, has been out, of course, um, or whether it's uh, what's happening in, in uh, South America, you know, even I learned, and I think I know everything about environmental issues um, here in the States and abroad. Um, so, you know, for me personally, I'll say that it helped me connect more with my relatives, my indigenous relatives continent um, in a way that, you know, I, I would never have imagined. Um, and not just from the negative experiences that we've had, but, but the beautiful ways that we have uh, developed to cope with these things, right? Through music, uh, through dance, through ceremony, uh, through song and through family, um, all of those things. I think uh, we're just really powerful. Um, so I hope, I hope that we will get the opportunity, you know, to take the film directly into communities, but right now it's just not safe um, to do so. And I think, you know, we'll have to, we'll have to look at um, if, whether or not that becomes a, a thing that makes sense in the future. You know, this, pandemic can be with us for another year or two. Um, 
So that's that's kind of, I, I hope that answers <laughs> your question. Yes, and it leads into uh, Clement, before you're totally tired, which is probably already, right? Um, but can you, you might have something to add. And then also if we could pick up on the question, where can photography and documentaries best be shared to impact and spread the word about issues of concern? How can they become more visible? I mean, even in this trauma, yeah. we've ended up in this Zoom, you know, um, forum coming together from all these continents. Um, so there are new models that we're learning. Um, so do you want to try to respond to, to that question? Sure. Um, I mean, the easiest would have been to uh, do some concessions, some, uh, you know, balance the decisions we did when producing the film so that then we would package it, we would have packaged it the right way to sell it to the right distributors. And then we could switch to the next project and switch to the next social justice project, the next, you know, like big issue, maybe to the next riot, maybe to the next uh, social movement. Uh, you know, and we would follow the urgency of like uh, project after project, social media, uh, social movement after social movement. Uh, and we would just be, we would just be part of the problem, I think, you know, because when you are a privileged person, when you're a white guy like myself, and you are actually reporting on um, impacted communities led initiatives, you really need to be uh, fully involved into what you are doing. It's not like a job, you know, it's not like another film. It's not like another project. It's not like I am reporting on uh, extractive industries and I'm going to extract, you know, uh, images and cultures <laughs> and moments, private moments in the life of others, but rather how can we be part of a movement when this film, you take your film and you are going to speak, you know, to privileged people, to larger groups, to the big greens, and let them know that there, there is a way that storytelling and filmmaking can actually be a way to decolonize our own organizations, decolonize the way, you know, we think that um, taking a stand, stand for justice is, is, is enough. You know, it is not enough. These film shows and our um, path as filmmakers who produce this film shows that what you need to do is to take the time to sit with your own shit and darkness and look at it a good while because you'll have to wait a good, another good long while before you can, you know, uh, speak on behalf of, uh, of, of those communities that are actually living the real impacts of our, of our way of life. And uh, so I don't have much to say really I don't have much to put in place. I can just try to connect people together, facilitate connections, you know, amplify voices, but I don't have much to say. Thank you for not listening to me then. <laughs> That's it. Now it's time, <laughs> the last sentence, it's time for me to go to sleep. <laughs> yeah, so I remind people it's 3.15 3 for me, so. Oh, thank you. Jade, you can go to sleep and thank we thank you. Jade, do you want to answer that question? Brian and I are saying that we think you would have you would you would be the person to answer this question. <laughs> how how bad how things can become more visible? That question. Yeah, where can how, how can you photography and documentaries best be shared to impact and spread the word about issues of concern? How can they become more visible? Yeah. Yeah, I think um, you know it starts with building relationship. Um, and and uh, and also challenging institutions. I think right now we're in a big moment where we're seeing a lot of amazing uprising, challenging um, white supremacy and power um, within different institutions, including the media. Um, and I, I I'm thinking of a, a beautiful uh, initiative or. Uh, project, I guess, that kind of evolved or emerged during the movement for, during this uh, movement for Black Lives that we're in. And, and it was actually like towards the beginning, it was like, it was maybe like a week or so um, after a lot of the protests started to emerge throughout the country here in the U.S. And um, what, what I saw was uh, people creating these spreadsheets and sharing them 
um, online on social media of, of black photographers. Um, and it was, it was shared widely. I mean, some of um, some Nat Geo photographers who have like, you know, couple million photographer, uh, couple million followers on Instagram uh, shared these and, and these were white photographers shared these spreadsheets that amplified uh, black photographers in that moment to be the ones who are hired by editors and producers to, you know, tell that story. Uh, obviously, that's the right thing to do. And uh, that's, that's something that definitely combats this thing. Um, the, this thing we know as uh, extractive storytelling. So um, I really do think, you know, we have to become stronger and more persistent at challenging editors, challenge, challenging producers to hire people from these communities um, to tell their own stories and to, uh, to really, you know, prioritize uh, this type of storytelling. Um, and I think, you know, as long as we, you know, continue that kind of pressure, continue that kind of demand, we get to see, you know, those institutions change. Um, and I think, you know, just being bold with, with your outreach. Um, there's so many, uh, there's so many publications, outlets, uh, institutions, even I'm thinking of like, uh, you know, different programs at the Smithsonian or these types of uh, these types of institutions that have capacity to do large scale multimedia photography projects. Um, yeah, get in the, you know, reach out, get in their community, um, you know, start building out those those project decks and, you know, your website. I know that's something that you know, definitely requires time and labor and resources. But um, as long as, you know, we keep showing up and putting ourselves out there um, and, and then, you know, working with uh, collectives. Uh, uh, Brian and I have been a part, and Leo have been a part of the Indigenous Rising Media Collective, which, you know, began um, maybe five years ago uh, at COP21 in Paris and um, has just grown since. Um, I, I'm no longer a producer there, but um, some really good friends hold it down. And um, there's a lot of visibility that came through and happened through that project. So I think, you know, doing, doing your research to find out where, you know, these indigenous led or black led or Latinx led outlets are, um, I, I see them starting to get more and more visibility because, uh, because these, outlets that have been for so long, like historically white led covering, you know, white stories. Um, they're like, oh no, we're in a moment. Like we have to diversify. And, you know, part of that is, you know, it's, it's you know, to, to us folks of color, like that might be a little, you know, uh, we might feel some feels about that, maybe some skepticism about uh, like virtue signaling, but, Honestly, I think I think we're in a moment where we're starting to see that cultural shift happen, um, where people are really valuing uh, diverse stories, and and I think for folks of color, we just we have to take advantage of that. Thank you, Leo. Do you want to add to that? Also, maybe tell. Oh wait, we don't hear you. We're you're muted. Also, maybe tell us a little more about Indigenous Rising Collective. Are you still part of that? Are you still part of the Indigenous, Indigenous Rising Collective? Leo started his media. own thing. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, I, uh, well, first of all, I, I wanted to add to what Jay was saying. I think yeah. um, when people watch something, and give their own personal critique or their own a personal uh, review about a project or about something that uh, they have uh, has touched their hearts and share with their friends. I think that is a very powerful initiative, a powerful tool to really share with your with your your local groups and your family. I think that's that has a huge impact in. Um, uh, for uh, independent media. 
also with indigenous rising media, I think it's, uh, what happened is that a lot of the, we didn't have any, any type of indigenous media in the US, you know? So I think when indigenous rising media started, it, uh, it really triggered this, uh, this way of like uh, showing stories made by, uh, by indigenous people, for indigenous people, for our communities, uh, for the communities of, of color. And I think um, emphasizing that, I, and I mean, because I'm from Ecuador, I'm from the Amazon in Ecuador, and I had the chance to be in the U.S. with uh, with my brothers and sisters to tag along the marches, their strikes, their 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 processes. There, I've learned so much about um, indigenous rising media that I decided to to start a process in Ecuador. You know, not right now uh, through the Haku project, which is my organization, we're starting to do capacity building and uh, healing for the youth in the Amazon and teach them tools about storytelling mm. and narrative, video making. And also at the same time, we use these spaces to create a safe space for healing because a lot of our communities do not have those spaces for healing and like really healing trauma and sharing, like sharing across, like uh, sharing uh, with uh, your, your peers from across the Amazon. We might be from different ethnic groups, but we we ha uh, we happen to go through the same traumatic experiences of of losing our territories, mm. uh, oil mining sessions. Not only in Ecuador, there is the the this uh, this group in Brazil that I'm very impressed with. Uh, it's called Media uh, uh, Media India. It's uh, indigenous media in Brazil. They are so powerful. Mm -hmm. They make beautiful. Stories. They make amazing stories. They 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 were in the last climate of uh, rally in New York in um, last year, and then they were at the COP. And I went to visit them uh, after the fire. Uh, during the fires, I met them in Brazil, and, and the work they're doing with 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 the media and 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 sharing and and positioning indigenous issues on the front lines of the media. They have Sonia Wajajara, who's a uh, um, an amazing human who she's at the forefront of the fight for indigenous women rights and 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 the forest people's rights and she's like advocating for uh, policy change in the in the uh, in the Bolsonaro government which is like uh, go, uh, Bolsonaro government is atrocious and like indigenous media um, uh, is doing an amazing work and I think we need to replicate those good processes from the South, from the North, and, and share among our brothers and sisters through the continent. So that's why I'm, I'm like, I think um, I'm, I'm, I am building a bridge with, uh, with uh, the few people that have, have the, the platform and the access to attend to and meet these amazing people working on these different projects. I'm learning that and bringing it to my community and, 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 and sharing these experiences. And I think that is one of the, the, the biggest ways to support uh, locally and uh, to be viewed internationally or something. Whoa. <laughs> Thank you for building the bridge. Yeah. 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 also came to Ecuador to work with us with some of the groups that we work with and she make the connection and we're still I think this is this is amazing you know we have Jade Brian you know like we've met in different spaces and now we are like we're building movement from all the spaces we are based out of and that is an important thing that is so inspiring mm -hmm. and I don't want to miss this question that was earlier from Emily Berkemeyer who says, as an RPI student myself, so this is being sponsored partially by RPI. I'm an RPI professor. And so um, she's saying, as just an RPI student, right, in America, a college student, how can college students help now that when you build these bridges to, how can they help promote indigenous people's voices, college students in the US and around the world? Anybody want to take that one, that question? I will. Um, I think uh, college students um, probably have, you know, access to different like face group, Facebook groups that maybe like us uh, 
millennial, old millennials or boomers, you know, might not have. I think there's like a whole world of social media that, um, you know, yeah, even my millennial generation is kind of, you know, not super plugged into like TikTok. Um, I see so much amazing um, narrative shift, narrative change work happening on TikTok. And I think that's just going to be super critical um, in, in the coming months, um, you know, uh, as we as we grapple with continued, you know, uh, rise of COVID rates as we move closer to an election month um, and, you know, just just quickly, you know, getting on my soapbox about that. Um, voter suppression has already started in many places. And I think um, continuing to uplift ways in which we uh, we combat voter suppression is going to be really important. Um, and I think, you know, it's been talked about for, you know, four years at this point that um, you know, that kind of demographic of young college students is going to be super, super critical in this upcoming election. And I think that just continuing to uplift um, initiatives to get out the vote, to support um, anti-voter suppression work that's happening, targeting uh, Black communities, Indigenous communities, um, if the youth can continue to uplift that and, and you know, help create a massive youth turnout for November, I think that's going to be really critical in, in this long-term cultural societal shift. You know, we, we have so many things um, that could easily be stopped um, with a change of power in the White House in November, um, namely the KXL pipeline. Um, you know, just that is a huge issue for Indigenous communities and really communities throughout the world. Um, and so, you know, because it's a climate issue um, that could easily be stopped in November. You know, uh, a candidate has already, uh, Biden has already committed to stopping that if elected. And so I think we just need to get that, you know, immediate support from the youth. Um, and then just on an ongoing, um, in an ongoing way, uh, I think it's, it's just important to continue to, you know, lift us up, bring us to the table. Um, you know, your generation is going to, you know, it's, you know, as people say, you know, you're going to be leading the way and um, just continuing to bring Indigenous folks, people of color to the table, uh, whether you're leading uh, college film screening events or um, college panels on different types of issues. Uh, I think, you know, I see this often even in the progressive movement. Uh, Native people are brought on to do a land acknowledgement and that's it, or we're brought in at the 11th hour. <laughs> and um, yeah, and it's just, it's, uh, it's, yeah, on, it's insulting and um, it's just not cool. So uh, yeah, continuing to just elevate voices in a thoughtful, respectful and intentional way. Um, I think that work is definitely still needed in, in, in all places, especially, you know, the progressive, uh, the progressive movement space. Thank you for that great response. Brian, um, this leads to Natalie. Nat Natalie has a series of questions. Can you represent Clement um, uh, for these questions uh, that have to do with accountability? Um, and um, that's a, do you, what do you want to try? I mean, I can, I can add my perspective um, for sure. And, uh, you know, quickly just in, in reflection of the last question to they support ethnic studies at all grade levels um, in the schools. It's a really powerful tool. Um, and, you know, have our back, have our, back, you know, keep your eye out for white supremacy, for patriarchy, for all of the the isms um, and speak up those things happen. Um, so in terms of accountability, you know, I think I think that's part of it too, right? You know, Clement and I and uh, his wife, Sophie, you know, and my partner, Liana, 
um, like we all worked incredibly hard on this and we, we had, you know, late nights and arguments and big conversations. And that was the beautiful part of the process, you know, to, to understand um, so many different perspectives in trying to get this right. You know, it's hard to document a story when you're in it, when you're living it, you know, it's hard to separate yourself um, from your own personal perspectives. And I think that's, you know, part of the narrative that we need to dismantle. Um, you know, that shouldn't be a problem. You know, that's what keeps people of color in these communities from telling their own story. Um, certainly, you know, from mainstream media because we're perceived as biased or emotional or whatever, right? But in terms of just the, you know, technical uh, and, and, and the physical requirements, um, the technology, the equipment, all of those things, like we just don't have access to that oftentimes. So, you know, we're starting from, from scratch. A lot of the projects that I've participated in, I've had money um, to, to just be a part of them. When I went to the tar sands, you know, we, we had to have a, a GoFundMe, you know, uh, page um, and raise money just to go up there, you know, to have the opportunity. We did this, you know, to go to South America. Um, and I think, you know, all of us were not paid, you know, to, to do this work. Um, and, and Clement and Sophie, you know, were also not paid. They used a lot of their own personal money and money from friends and family. Um, but that, that also, you know, that's, that's sort of one way that people of privilege, privilege can support. Use your, your wealth, your resources um, to do good in the world. Um, that doesn't mean that's all you have to do. You know, you still have to be accountable day in and day out. You still have to speak up when you see, you know, things happening in front of you. You still have to fight, you know, all those isms within yourself. Um, and so it's, it's not like it's ever uh, an end point to that process. Um, with filmmaking, you know, we know that there are disparities in who gets to go to film school who gets to go to, you know, media schools, undergrad and graduate. Um, like I said, I learned on my own. Leo, did you go to college and learn how to, how to make media? No, <laughs> I don't think so. Jade, did you go to and learn how to make media? I did go to film school. All right. Um, <laughs> That's awesome. And how, but, but the numbers, how many, how many other students uh, of color and indigenous students were there with you? Um, so I went to college at uh, Columbia College Chicago, um, great film program. And, uh, you know, for, for art schools, it was, a, it was actually a really um, great experience. Um, lots of people of color, um, but definitely not indigenous people. I think I was definitely the one of the, I, I never came across a fellow indigenous um, student in the film program. Um, I hope things are changing at this point, but um, I mean, that's been my entire experience throughout uh, high school, college, graduate school. Um, and uh, yeah, we'll, perhaps be the case until, like I said, there was like, like some serious institutional change, uh, which, you know, has to come from uh, the people demanding it. I really, I believe yeah. that, you know, there's great momentum now. I'm seeing lots of accountability take place and it feels really exciting. Um, I just hope it continues and people keep putting the pressure on and our allies continue to acknowledge and, um, and reckon with the ways in which institutions, including schools or museums or 
media, whatever it is, um, have have been complacent in white supremacy. Yes. Leo, do you want to answer? Your microphone is up now. How do you learn how to be a filmmaker? Yeah, I didn't. I still have not. <laughs> <laughs> I'm in the process. I've been working on um, and I'm doing advocacy work for, I don't know. <laughs> I, I went to my first uh, uh, social forum in 2001 and I was 11 or 12 years old. And um, and uh, you know we've been telling stories, but not necessarily using media. But uh, and uh, yeah, I just started making media because um, uh, people would contact me to talk about things related to the Amazon, and I would work as a producer doing uh, those kind of things. And I was like, oh, maybe I can produce my own thing, you know, and like work with my own people and and learn and share these things, these tools with uh, with my communities. So that's why I just started and uh, it's been great. And like the next generation, I hope there's more and more people because there, there's very few of us and around the world. So the more the mayor. Thank you. And, and um, Kathy, hi, is asking a question, which actually we had started. Brian, do you want to respond? Because you were talking about uh, lack of access um, of um, resources for Indigenous people is a critical issue. So how can people help with resources and what is most needed? Are there shared equipment reserves in various communities, shared travel funds, etc.? In early media days, there were media centers that loaned equipment to communities. What are possible models now that you can imagine to support media making? Yeah, I mean, I, I think the one, you know, telling the story is one part of the process. And to do that, you know, folks have to be ready. Um, it takes it takes some um, long-term strategy and organizing um, to get there. Because some stories can lead to dangerous situations for people, you know, and we know that there are really high numbers of killings, for example, or organi environmental organizers in Central and Latin America. But also here in the U.S. and in Canada, there's violence enacted on, um, you know, activists and, and land defenders and land protectors. And so, you know, that's one part of it. I think, uh, the resource question has to do with inequality, you know, from the day someone is born um, and communities being under-resourced, um, not having parents that uh, have a higher education experience, living in a community um, that doesn't have good schools, clean water, clean air, um, all of these things sort of lead to a situation where it's just really difficult um, to escape all of that, right? So, you know, it's hard to know what story to tell and there's just so much going on. And so it's, uh, I, like, I like the ideas of, you know, resource sharing. Um, and I think that's kind of what, you know, I tried to do. I was fortunate to grow up in a big city, Houston, um, where there was a public radio station um, and it was my mom who told me about this organization, Nuestra Palabra. And so I started volunteering there and, uh, and they had this radio um, program on KPFT. You know, so that's where I learned how to produce radio. And I didn't really start talking or anything on the show for a couple of years. You know, I was so interested and fascinated uh, with listening to writers um, that, you know, that had the same similar experiences as myself. Um, it takes, you know, some, a process, right? To see it um, before you can start creating yourself. At least that's how I felt and, and how I sort of engaged in it. The, the media, these ideas, um, so cell phones, you know, and internet, and you know worldwide publication you know became possible during this time so my answer would not be 
probably useful for um, the younger folks that are growing up today. Like TikTok, I never used TikTok. <laughs> I thought it was just for like dancing videos. Um, but somehow, like they found out how to like make it a really powerful tool and really messed up 45's last, uh, <laughs> and embar like embarrassed the heck out of him. Made him look foolish. Like, wow, incredible. That's using media, right? And, and, and something that just seemed so benign at the time, like, boom. So that's, that's the kind of creativity. Um, of course, folks need the phone, right? They need access to the internet, um, all of those things for that to happen. And, uh, and I think young folks will figure out how to do the rest if they have clean air, if they have clean water, if they have schools, you know, um, that just has to be all part of the package. And it, uh, for those who have all of that, but don't have the equipment, you know, I think that's where institutions like universities, foundations, and even communities can help uh, support um, independent media makers. Thank you. Jane, do you want to add to this? Yeah, yeah. Perfect segue to what I was going to say is um, I think uh, the best way to support, you know, voices from the ground, so to speak, is to do that research and due diligence to find out who are the grassroots um, people, organizers, uh, projects, communities, or organizations who who often um, don't have budgets for communications. I I I would know. I, my um, my entire career has been working with uh, you know grassroots and indigenous nonprofits, and oftentimes, um, yeah, our our budgets for media and communications uh, are are the last thing on the on the annual budget, you know? Um, and so I think looking for those organizations, looking for those groups who are very grassroots, are very connected to community and community oriented, those are where I, I have learned in my experience, those are where the best storytellers are. Those are where the, the people closest to the pain, they know how to talk about what's going on. They are the truth tellers and they need resources. They need support and amplification. They need equipment. Um, they need training. You know, I, I, I love uh, what Leo mentioned um, in, in that, on that training bit. Um, and yeah, we were able to do some training, um, not, not together, but similar projects where we did uh, media trainings, film trainings in, in the jungle. And um, I think that that type of experience could um, literally change someone's life, um, giving them that, um, that opportunity to really believe in their, their story and their, the, the power of their voice. So just want to underscore that, um, yeah, uh, that grassroots organizations often need um, support major support in their storytelling communications work um, because ultimately when it comes down to it what what we're up against as these native or indigenous uh, grassroots organizations or nonprofits we're we're trying to tell you know ch change the world change these meta narratives which are paid for by corporations with billion dollar budgets for ads, for marketing, for communications firms. Um, and we're, we're dealing with, uh, you know, a thousand times less type of budgets. So um, yeah, continuing just to look into those organizations, uh, really, you know, putting the time and effort into finding out, you know, who are the trusted uh, groups on the ground. Um, that's another thing, you know, it's really important to look out for uh, groups who are really trusted, members of a community who are really trusted. Um, I've seen so often, you know, the mic has been given to somebody who wasn't a trusted uh, person of the community and, and, and then you end up in a situation where, you know, a, a message that's not 
um, supporting the community's needs is getting amplified. And that's a whole other can of worms. <laughs> but yeah, it's really important to, um, to be really diligent about, you know, who, who you're supporting, who you're, whose voice you're lifting up. And is it, is it a voice that's really trusted and, and respected by the local community? Yes, thank you. I know that we've done our hour, but this is just, words cannot express how inspiring each of you are. Um, should, could we just, do you each wanna have some final words? Um, some, anything you wanna share, Brian? I'll check and see if Leo was motioning to go first. Um, yeah, I, I, as you were talking, Jay, too, I was just thinking um, in the question, like how beautiful it was to see how Standing Rock was resourced with media and equipment through these wish lists. Like that was just incredible. Um, and the drone footage, right, that came from that. Um, so there, there are moments, you know, I think where um, we, can, we can help with specific instances. Uh, last thoughts are just that, you know, it's, uh, it's an interesting time um, right now and Houston is having in uh, COVID-19. Um, and I know that, you know, early on in March, I was feeling really, really good for some reason. It was just beautiful and, and the whole world seemed to have stopped. Right, and there was there was a, a pause and time for reflection, um, like like no other time before, and it's it's been really hard to just see how the U.S. in particular, you know, has has taken that time uh, to create a lot of false, um, like <laughs> these false, you know. Dichot dichotomies of like uh, mask, no mask, testing, no testing. Um, and, you know, I feel like we missed an opportunity to really come together uh, as, as a nation. Um, and a lot of that has been stoked by the media. You know, a lot of it has been um, because of 45 himself, um, but also because of how 45 is reported on. And there seems to be this reticence of critiquing um, or not, you know, just publishing everything that he says, <laughs> knowing that it's gonna cause harm, will lead to people's death um, in some instances. So I wanna leave folks with, you know, this opening um, that we need more media right now Right now is the time for many voices um, to be heard and we need dialogue and we need, you know, people being honest um, and really being um, strategic about, you know, how we produce media that will lead to some positive change. Um, and I, I, uh, I just want to leave that with folks, you know, it's like you have a phone. Everyone's got a, a film making, radio making toolkit right here. <laughs> and, uh, you know, to use it, use it in a constructive way. Yeah. Thank you. Leo? Leo, do you want to have a final word? Yeah. I just wanted to say uh, thank you to my fellow, fellow panelists. It's always a pleasure to share spaces with you and learn, always learning from uh, our peers. Um, for the audience, I just want to say that this is a very crucial time. You know, this is a very crucial time for our generation. What's happening with COVID has exacerbated what is uh, what is impacting the communities uh especially communities in color who are the for forefront of the fight against climate change uh, the, uh we're protecting the forces of the world the resources you know like support support your communities let's build movement you know we are this uh, this is a defining time that where we are seeing the limits of 
capitalism, of policing, of militarism. You know, we need to change that. You know, we, the minorities come from 500, of, 500 years of colonization in which our communities have been devastated. Our fellow brothers and sisters have been killed. You know, there's systemic violence, violence, there's systemic racism. This is a time that we all need to wake up and, uh, and mutually work together in solidarity, but real solidarity. Like, uh, just think about what is like real solidarity. You know, it's not just posting something on Instagram. It's about talking to your friend, talking to your black friend, talking to your uh, uh, neighbor, who's an immigrant, how are you supporting your community? You know, there's many, many ways, you know, I always tell people, you don't have to come to the Amazon to save the world. You have to start in your own home, you know, in your own communities, with your own family, with your own relatives. That's where we start. And that's how we build a movement, into, you know, like locally, but little by little, we create this network of people uh, fighting for social and environmental justice, justice and against systemic racism, which we are seeing right now. And uh, yeah, I love being here with you. I, I hope to see you all soon when things change and keep up with the great work you're doing all the time. And um, yeah, you, you keep inspiring me all the time. And I love your comment, Brian, that we hear the rainforest applauding Leo's words. Jade, you have the last word. Oh, wow, such a responsibility. <laughs> um, yeah, echoing what Leo said, just really honored to continue to work with uh, all of these friends um, and uh, collaborators um, and, and be able to share a platform together. I'm just grateful to Clement and you, Brenda. And yeah, thanks for having us. Um, I think I, I do wanna do a kind of shameless plug <laughs> um, for my organization. I think there is a couple of questions, even, even the, you know, how, how do we make uh, more visibility happen for native artists, um, indigenous artists. And um, one way uh, would be to amplify this link I'm about to drop in the comments. Um, my organization, Endian Collective, just launched this grant opportunity uh, for Native folks within the U.S. territories. I, I pray that one day we'll be able to offer a, in, a global Indigenous grant uh, or fund. Uh, for now, we're a new organization. We're only a year and a half old. Uh, but uh, this opportunity is for Indigenous artists, filmmakers, cultural bearers. Uh, we want to provide six Indigenous artists with uh, fifty thousand uh, dollars to lean into their radical imagination and build uh, a project that will help us envision a new world um, or a different world, changed world. And um, yeah, so please help us share this uh, to as many Native people, artists, cultural barriers you can. Um, and uh, yeah, you can learn more about Indian Collective on that link as well. And uh, yeah, I, I am just so excited about, um, yeah, all the work that Leo is doing, that Brian is doing, that this film, um, this, I'm so excited about this, imp uh, the impact of this film, all the people in it are dear friends, people I've been learning from and being mentored by for, uh, for a long time. And so just uh, really excited to have, this film be a part of, you know, all this work to change narrative and 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 bring um, more justice and equity to our communities. So I guess the last ask is to share the film, right? <laughs> Watch and support and share the film. Thank you. And that's it. I'm done. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. Brian, you want to say a final thing about the film and sharing the film, how to continue if people wanted to join the impact campaign? 
Yeah, I mean, there's uh, more screenings coming up. So if you were inspired and you enjoyed uh, watching the film, um, or if you just want to hear more Indigenous voices, you know, there will be conversations after each screening um, may be of interest to you. There's uh, a really cool one happening uh, with Judith, uh, another protagonist, um, and some folks um, in Australia, um, I think tomorrow. So, you know, just take a look at the website. Um, don't, don't stop now that you've seen the film. Um, share it with your friends, as Jade said. Support the organization that uh, Jade and Leo um, work with and have started. Support their personal work um, and support local indigenous artists in your community. Find out who they are. Find out whose land you're on. <laughs> you know, there's so many ways to help um, bring more voices to the public eye. And I, uh, I hope you know, I do have hope for the coming years. Um, and again, just want to thank you all for joining us tonight. Thank you, Brenda, um, and all the independent media community um, that has, you know, really helped elevate voices like ours too across across the globe um, through radio, uh, through documentary films, um, and through books. Yeah, be the media. Media. Thank you all. Thank you. Bye. Bye, Jade. Bye, Bye Leo. Good night. Be yeah. safe. <laughs>